I've said it all before I don't wanna spin this broken record anymore Who, oh, what's it gonna take? My dear Whaley and Tal, how's it going dudes? Welcome to Permastoked yo, yo. Going well man, stoked Right yeah. on man, how are you dudes? Well, I'm I'm doing great. Thank you. Um, thanks for having us. This is this is awesome. I'm a huge hey. fan, so it's it's an honor. Yeah, awesome. man, I'm doing super well over here as well. And uh, gotta figure out how to do this format here. Make sure I don't talk over anyone. So, no <laughs> but problem. yeah, man, I'm stoked to be here. I love the podcast. Thanks for having me. Right on. So, hey, were you guys in the water today, or when's the last time you were out surfing? Uh, Tao, you got that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh what is it, friday it was this last friday i th- uh, think we were out on yeah would have been friday yeah this this past friday we kind of we thought there's going to be like a tiny little you know not so good day at at ashbridge's bay but we still decided to go out because we're like any day any day that there's any waves is better than flat and uh yeah, we ended up going out and it was actually really good. And uh, we were even, even able to like kind of get some some shortboard waves and it got really clean towards the end. And it was, it was awesome. It was like one of those unexpected epic surf days. I was so pumped when I got home. It was just like, and we kept talking about it after. It was awesome. Yeah, man, that was a great day. was not expecting that. And I don't think anyone else was either because we were one of the few people out there so it wasn't big enough for the cove to work but it was uh it was really good for ashbridge's bay and it was really clean surprisingly and it was an awesome day nice amazing yeah i'm gonna have to come check those spots out guys i uh i haven't been out to that scene yet but i'm stoked for you know everything i hear about the cove and all these spots you guys uh so so how long have you guys been a part of the surf community out there um tal's been a part of it for way longer than i have uh he's kind of the, the dude who brought me into it all actually nice. um for me it's been i'll be going on my second winter season uh for tal i'm not sure he could probably tell you i i think this this will be i'm just trying to think this will be my, no this will be actually my third winter uh third maybe fourth I, I i keep losing track i think it was for me like or somewhere around uh i think the winter of 2018 maybe that i kind of really got into it um yeah and that's basically when i got back into surfing period so, so you know yeah. most people are chasing the endless summer i mean out here we're chasing the endless winter <laughs> yeah until it freezes over man yeah the real canadian surf scene <laughs> So, uh, it's definitely odd. Yeah. So how does surfing, uh, you know, we'll get into your musical origins and whatnot, but while we're on the topic of surfing, how does uh, surfing pl- influence your music? It's a great question. And I think probably about a month ago, I was doing a podcast with Tao as well. And I would have answered this question entirely differently. Um, but I think now it's definitely an escape from music. Um, but it does influence it in so many ways here, particularly particularly in Ontario. I think the community actually has a big part to, to do with uh, how it influences the music because you get to meet all these people and they're interested in what you're doing. You start building little connections, whether it's with, the you know the, the guys at the surf shop or or you know people out at the lineup that you find out they're into to film or something like that and then you guys start doing something but i think there's so many different angles you could look at it uh but the, in the past month or so it's been a great escape and that's influenced my music for the better because it's just given me time to to take a breather yeah so music uh you know it it becomes a job after a while right so surfing is actually some reprieve from that well i think i think surfing uh especially in the great lakes is such a difficult thing to do it's such a you know there's so much that goes on goes into it you know as opposed to ocean surfing where there's you know 
so much more forecasting and having to be able to respond to things in the moment, whether it's choosing the day you're going surfing or choosing what wave to paddle into, you know, it's everything is moving so fast that I think it doesn't allow you a second to think about music. And I think most musicians I know who are like, like, you know, what I call lifers, mm -hmm. um, they think about it all the time. And this is one of the only situations where, you know, you're in the water, you don't have your phone on you, you don't have any way to record anything, and you don't have, your mind can't even think about a new lyric or a new song or anything. So it's, it's a, it's an experience that's completely detached from making music in that sense. And I think once you're out of the water and you, you know, you make it back to the car and you take your wetsuit off and you get home and you wash your gear and you're like exhausted because you just basically paddled nonstop for five hours. It kind of cleanses you of any, you know, negative residue you may have had in your life. And then the next time you write a song, it's like, it's, it's a fresh perspective. And I, I find it's, it's made my, my music a lot better just because I'm better mentally. So mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's truly a meditative state, eh? So you, you guys are saying that surfing is uh, provides you that space in between music to really just drop everything, let your mind go, and be refreshed for when uh, writing or inspiration needs to be turned back on again. Yeah, I would say so for sure. I think I was arguing this probably about a month ago, like I said, but things have really ramped up recently and <laughs> i think i get it now you, uh, riding down the line there so i think you're doing all right out there yeah that's that's pure luck man uh <laughs> that's pure <laughs> luck it just having to be at the right place the right time i think tal and i were out on lake erie and out of you know just fate i just caught a beautiful right and I, I was like on it. I'm like, man, I'm going to get barreled on this. And uh, <laughs> it was a great wave. And I couldn't believe it. The next morning, Tal sends me an Instagram photo. He's like, oh, dude, check this photo out, man. Someone got you on the wave. And it was just like a surreal moment for me. I just have to say, it wasn't fate. When we paddled out that day and I saw the waves and I saw, you know, where we were and how you know how everything was lining up i was like you're gonna get a good one today man i i know it. this is the day and literally he got that one and i saw it from the from the back i saw him drop into that i was like oh my god like i was like this is this is his wave and sure enough it was that yeah. one so yeah, yeah it wasn't he, he's been working for it that's a great shot guys you know i gotta tell you i am man i don't know jealous is the right word but you know, you guys are out there, you're talking about surfing on the Great Lakes in the lineup. You're talking to all these guys. I mean, I'm thinking back to when I started surfing on the Great Lakes, the likelihood of me having a conversation with anybody would have been like, I would have had better luck talking to a carp than another person. <laughs> I mean, it just is amazing to hear you guys all out there uh, collaborating, you know, just man talking to other people wow what a what an epic scene out there yeah yeah we're, yeah, we're we're extremely fortunate i think we we came into it at the right time too because you know there have been so many people like larry like the guys from surf the greats like the guys from surf ontario um who built this you know this community um not to mention you know the the surf shops around you know lake huron um all those people they've they've really they've been you know much much like you derek they've been doing this for you know for a while and yeah they were alone in those lineups and not really talking to anybody and just kind of going off of like secret forms online and like word of mouth and now you've got like surf shops and and surf lessons and forecasting lessons and like any like if you want to learn how to surf properly in the great lakes the resources are there and it's incredible and the people are there and they're super nice yeah no, I absolutely agree. It's it's really delightful, man, to to look to see what's going on here. Like you'd heard me talk in the past about the fact that uh, you know I'm surfing. I'm living on the West Coast for 12 years, and 
you know, I'm on the Pacific Ocean, yet I'm looking on Facebook and I'm like, what the hell is happening? Like, it's blowing up on the Great Lakes in Canada. Like, I just can't believe it. So good for you guys. Glad you fell in with the right people. And, uh, you know, you guys are surfing. So life is, you know, pretty much complete now. Yep. So, hey, yeah, you know, tell me, just tell me a little bit about yourselves. And uh, so we'll give some context to the people here listening. Like, who am I even talking to? I got Whaley and I got Tal Weissman. Yeah. It's kind of uh, close to the uh, Ghostbusters Bankman. Uh, I don't know. It's all like German words. Okay. <laughs> right on, right on. Okay, so so what are you guys all about? Whaley, you go, man. Tell me uh, tell me about yourself and how you got into music. And uh, yeah, maybe even, I think you might have, yeah, even if it, if it branches over to surfing, tell us how you got into surfing as well. Yeah, music is a, is a super long story and I, and I would take days to dive into that fully, but it started when I was in high school, I'd say f- for real. And then it's kind of been been my main priority since then, um, and it's taken me a lot of different places. And it's it's kind of how it's actually how I ended up surfing on the Great Lakes. So it's kind of all ties in. But um, after high school, I wanted to do something different, so I ended up going out to Australia for a year um, to, I guess, in my head, pursue music in some way shape or form but really it was just the party okay. <laughs> and meet people um it had always been a dream of mine to surf though because i was in the skateboarding pretty heavily when i was a kid and snowboarding as well um and i'd never had the opportunity to, to try surfing so i remember i was getting really hyped for that going to australia i think it was only like the third or fourth day i was down there I went to the first surf shop I saw on Bondi beach because I was close to the area I was living. And I was like, what's the cheapest board you got? Sell it to me. I want to try surfing. Damn. Was that a bad move? That really made it hard. They gave me like a, I don't know what it was. It was like a six foot short board, like zero volume. I had no idea what I was doing. Just paddling out into the massive waves in Bondi that was an experience, but I kept at it. And, and uh, that year was interesting, but that's, that's not really where I got into surfing surprisingly as well. Maybe you should have said, give me the cheapest beginner board. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it, you don't want to like, you know, it's kind of weird when you're like maybe at the top of the food chain in the skate world, you don't want to look like a Grom in the surf world. So mm-hmm. It's, it's very embarrassing for an 18 year old dude to walk in and be like, I'm just learning, man, kind of thing. <laughs> I think I had a bit of an ego. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, this seems totally different down there too, though. It's a lot more intimidating, uh, you know, to be a new guy in the water there. And I think it's got a very like skatey vibe where, you know, you have to be really cool in the shops and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I'd say I could have had a better experience learning there. I didn't really give it my best shot, I'd say, but I, uh, I ended up coming back to Canada a year after and uh, kind of put the surfboard down, of course, because I didn't think it was possible. Continued on with music, you know, as, as I do. And, what happened uh, for you musically in Australia? Was there anything there that happened? Yeah, that was kind of like a game changing year for me, I'd say I I ended up getting by fluke, maybe fate a job at a vintage guitar shop, uh, right on the beach in a little, little suburb uh, outside of Sydney called Coogee Beach, or just Coogee. But um, that was great for me. I learned a lot about, about music and guitars and instruments and just the whole history behind all that kind of stuff, which I had no clue about before then. Um, and the guy who owned the shop was like a little, uh, family run place. He, he kind of became my mentor for that year and really shifted my, my music to go more towards like an Americana kind of country vibe. Um, prior to that, I I really wasn't into anything like that, but I'd say, yeah, that year, that year really changed my music a lot. It, It got me leaning more towards there and less towards, 
punk or rock. So not much really happened. I, I had a busking permit. I, I would go play on the beach, try to make a couple, a uh, couple bucks there. Yeah. And I played a couple open mics and a couple little gigs there, but it mainly is a, is a learning year for me, I'd say down there music wise for sure. And uh, you know, I made a lot of great connections and that sort of thing, but nothing really came of that year music wise other than the knowledge. But uh, yeah, I think I, when I, when I landed back in Canada, I was still interested in surfing and I, that would have been 2014 like, or sorry, early 2015. And uh, I was kind of like researching what you could do surf wise in Canada. There wasn't a whole lot coming up on the Great Lakes, but it was, it was kind of showing up here and there on Google. I was like trying to dive in, see what was going on. And uh, I didn't really know anyone at the time doing it. And I don't know if Surf the Greats was around or Surf Ontario. I'm not sure. You guys could probably correct me. Surf on Ontario would have been um, around that year, but I'm not sure when Surf the Greats, it would have been not too much longer after that anyways. Yeah. But anyhow, there wasn't that much. It's kind of similar like, to what you were saying there. I didn't really see too many people doing it there wasn't youtube videos there wasn't instagram posts there wasn't anything you know so i kind of put that dream on hold for a bit i think and uh i ended up moving to montreal for a year after that till 2016 uh then i came back to toronto and i you know i played in a whole bunch of different bands and I had a whole bunch of different musical ventures in between then but uh it all started really picking up when I started a band called Andrew and Beta, which was a folk duo uh, with my girlfriend at the time. And that, that started sort of really picked up my music uh, life. We, we cut a, a full length record in Hamilton at a spot called Catherine North. So and what was, in, what was influencing your music? What were you writing about? What was your, your message? At that time, it was all love songs, man. I mean, a lot of it is. <laughs> nice. A lot of it is, right? It's. I think it's hard for me. Well, I think it's hard for any artist to to find what their true message is, and you know, until they're very established. At first, it's kind of like you're just trying to find what'll work for you. You, you don't. Sure. I didn't really. At least in that band, we did. It was just all love songs, man. It's like let's write a good song. What's it about? I don't know, man. At least for me, that's how it was. It could have been different for her. <laughs> I was just trying to write good songs never that know. sounded good. But um, yeah, from there, we, we kind of performed and recorded as a duo for a year. That would have brought us to like 2017. That's kind of where stuff backfired with that project. Um, advice for folks listening. It's very hard to be in a band with your girlfriend so make sure your relationship is pretty solid before you do that wow, yeah. uh, but uh lose your rights to the music give me half of that song yeah luckily that's already how it works so i didn't lose much in that respect <laughs> but uh it screwed up a lot of other things okay uh, yeah and then you, don't, then you right can't now. write about love anymore man but hey then there's the most other the most popular other topic for songwriting is breaking up, right? Yeah, no, that's the easiest. And that's kind of what, what brings me to, to meeting Tao. It would have been early 2018. I was looking for my new, my new angle. And uh, I knew I wanted to do something really crazy, really new. I didn't really want it to be associated with, you know, my name. I wanted to, to have a sweet stage name and, I just wanted it to be completely different to anything I've ever done before. So uh, I reached out to someone I had met at a gig uh, named Andre, Andre Caden Black, and we decided we were going to cut an EP together. And just so happened that his uh, main man was Tao. And that's kind of where we, we got together. And, uh, you know, the rest is kind of history, man. We're just surf buds now. We, we still continue to write and work together in music. So, nice. I mean, I'm sure you can shed some light on that as well. And I think there's a cool little story of how we, we actually got into surfing together. 
Right but uh, Tao probably will tell it better than I will. <laughs> yeah. But hey, before we go there, what does uh, your stage name, Whaley, what does that signify? That's the most interesting and boring story at the same time. But <laughs> the short answer to that is I knew I, I'd already had a kind of music released under my own name, Andrew Sheriff. Uh, and that was kind of like very dark Americana, very, very like folk root stuff and uh, we were going for something different here i wanted to be able to explore the whole like pop realm big sounds that sort of thing so i knew i needed to create a stage name uh but it took me about a year and a half after we recorded the music to figure that out so we probably already been sitting on the whaley songs that we had done for a year and a half till i finally figured out a name and it's hard to figure out a name these days like there's so many people on the internet. Any good thing you think of is taken, man. Really? Yeah. It's really hard. So I don't I think one day I was driving, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I was driving to go pick up my girlfriend who lives out in the country. And I was at like a four-way crossroad and there was like a heritage sign that said Whaley's Corners. Okay. And I was just like, at the time, I, I really wanted to figure out what I was doing with my name. And I was like, ah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of got like an aquatic vibe. Uh, might, might be taken wrong. So let me change up the spelling a little bit and see if it, I was like, you know, I just kept saying it. I was like, this rolls off the tongue. And uh, eventually it just became a thing. And now, and now it feels very right. I must say it feels good. It suits oh. you, man. You look like a guy with the E sound at the end of his name. No <laughs> Like a Johnny or a Ronnie, you're a Whaley. It's perfect. But perfect, I gotta man. tell you, man, the name Sheriff, that is pretty badass, though. Yeah, man, I'm born to be a country singer. I just don't have the voice. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, or the yeah, truck. I don't have the truck yet. <laughs> well, you got that handlebar mustache. <laughs> I think you're only about one step shy. <laughs> <laughs> just show up to your next show in an 18 wheeler <laughs> it could be hey, just being the uh the first country artist to write solely about surfing yeah i can't i mean uh, that's like some australian country awards type of stuff right there man yeah like i wonder if keith urban's ever uh <laughs> been into surfing he's I probably know, really uh, good at surfing man like all the aussies you'd be surprised i was like I sent Tal an Instagram like way, way, way back and uh, it was a, like a random ad spot of Chris or Liam, Liam Hemsworth just shredding. I was like, what? Oh, wow. Like, yeah. No way. But they're yeah, just he like. Was, he was out with uh, Mick Fanning. They were testing out the new uh, Rip Curl wetsuits. Yes, there was a Rip Curl ad. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> amazing yeah. yeah well hey i know you also got kenny chesney i think you know he's got some very uh caribbean like he he does this really cool vacation music but i think that the the king of it all is jimmy buffett oh of course man that guy knows how to get the uh the aquatic lifestyle across in his music i mean it's awesome i think jimmy buffett is definitely a pontoon boat guy though i'd say <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> we could get towed on the back. Yeah. I'm just picturing a pontoon boat showing up at like at, at A Bay. It was like dropping us up. <laughs> That'd be so, so cool. Be so dope, Tal, fill in the blanks for us, man. Tell us about, you know, how did what was it like for you growing up? How'd you get into music and then maybe uh bridge us into this uh, story of you meeting Whaley and, and what that looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually grew up in Israel. That's where I was born. And, um, you know, uh, aside from four years that I lived in Turkey when I was like super young, um, and then we, we came back to Israel. And then when we came back to Israel, I think I was in the fifth grade. And um, if if there's one thing that's that was very common in Israel in the 90s and still is, is that every weekend, nobody does anything other than go to the beach because that's a free attraction that's just there so we all just went to the beach every weekend and uh 
I can't say back then that surfing was very big in Israel. Oh, sorry, let me just put my phone on silent. I don't know what this is. He's a popular man. Oh, so so unprofessional of me. Is that uh, surf reports? It better be. <laughs> no waves. Uh, what a surprise. Oh, yeah. Flat again. Um, yeah, but anyways, we, you know, we were going out to the, to the beach a lot, you know, just as a kid with my family and I've always been, you know, really, really into any water sport or just being in the water in general. And then I started seeing people surfing and I just, I was immediately drawn to it, but, uh, there was just not a lot of culture around it back then. Not, not many people in Israel surfed, or at least if they did, there's no social media, there's no real awareness, you know, in terms of schools and, and all that stuff. Nowadays, it's a completely different story. Now you go to Israel and any given, you know, surfable beach is packed with surfers. They all rip seven year old kids doing airs, you know, right next to you, like stuff like that. It's just wow. unreal. The, the scene there is completely blown up and it's 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 just a it's a treat i was there in december surfing there was just a week where it was pumping every day and it was i couldn't get a wave in the lineup to save my life because everybody was like pro surfers in i don't know lower trestles or something wow so, right on. yeah it's it's really come up but um anyways yeah and i think right when i was 10 i started playing guitar which was kind of just the thing, I found a guitar in, in the house we moved back into, and my dad was like, oh, yeah, I bought this before you were born, and I never had time to learn how to play this thing. So I was like, oh, thanks. I guess that's my fault. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I, I just, like, I don't know. I held it in my hands, and I was like, okay, I don't know how to play this, but I know that this is what I want to do with my life. Wow. And that's been you know the most the happiest and saddest day of my life at the same time because, you know i mean it it's 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 been hard you know me being a musician is is not the easiest thing in the world to say the least but it's yeah. been it's been really really cool so i think hand in hand at the same time i started kind of surfing in israel uh whenever i could um and playing guitar i was obsessed with playing guitar and i when I was in the seventh grade, I was already in a band and we were wow. writing songs and playing and just trying to be as loud as we can. And we were like all into like super heavy metal and, yeah. just, you know, and, and it fit really well back then with surf culture because in the nineties, it was kind of like surfers listened to hardcore and punk yeah. and, you know, just really heavy stuff. So it, it went hand in hand and, you know, then skateboarding and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, and then when I got to high school, I was just super, super like laser focused into music. I kind of stopped really surfing. I mean, I didn't really do it at all. And then I, um, yeah, I just kind of, I also went to like a special high school that specialized in music. So nice. I I was really, really immersed in that. Are and we then, still in Israel? For that? We're still in Israel. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is, uh, and then when you're 18 in Israel, you have to go to the military. So that doesn't really leave you a lot of time to surf at all. Wow. So, yeah. So once I got out of that, it was like, all right, I'm going back into bands and I'm going to just, you know, pursue music, which I did. And, um, so I kind of, really you went into the military. Yeah, you have to, it's not like, uh, you don't really get a choice. No, but you kind of you kind of breezed over that. So how long did you have to serve and and everything? Uh, well, it's a three year mandatory service. I did oh just under, <laughs> I did just under two uh, due to like you know I was I was sort of injured. Uh, well, won't go too deep into that, but I basically found my way out, and uh, I was stationed in you know some uh, problematic areas, let's just say, and uh, not not my fondest of memories. But anyways. That was done. Got over that. Um, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to dive right back into music. And I already had a band kind of that I was working with. And at uh, when I was 24, we kind of made the decision to move out of Israel because we were kind of hitting a ceiling that, you know, there's only so much you could do with rock music in Israel. So uh, we looked at some options and we almost moved to Seattle. Mm. Which uh, wouldn't have been a, been a bad spot, man. It is a wicked music scene there. Yeah, exactly. And we had some connections there, but uh, last minute, you know, 
our drummers, it's always the drummer, uh, our drummers <laughs> didn't. It's easy uh, what you say about drummers, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, dude. No, it's yeah. all right. You seem very intelligent. I didn't take you for a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I love you, drummers. Uh, anyhow, so, you know, he, his visa didn't work out. So we ended up uh, saying, well, we don't need any special visas to go to Canada. And Vancouver is only a couple of hours north of Seattle. So we can just kind of go back and forth. So we did. We moved to Vancouver and we were there for. Oh, so we were your second choice. Yes. <laughs> I was, uh, I wasn't, you know, I didn't even look at Toronto. Well, wow. I, I, should, I should say, I should say my singer at the time, she was like, I heard the winters in Toronto are God awful. We're not going yeah. there. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. Um, so yeah, anyways, um, we were in Vancouver for about 10 weeks and that wasn't really panning out. Uh, we met somebody from the music industry in Toronto who suggested, he said, well, look, if you're going to live in Canada and make music in Canada, make it in toronto yeah we moved to toronto um into this blizzard day uh january 1st 2010 and when we landed in toronto i felt like i made the biggest mistake of my life (laughs) 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 we left you know this beautiful place which is vancouver and landed in you know i I remember saying like oh i was by the mountains and the ocean and all that and then I've got this like lake that I can barely see because of the snow and all I see is concrete buildings and I'm from a small town. Yeah. So I'm not like, I'm not used to any of that. But, um, so we all said like, you know, we're giving this couple of months, whatever, like we're going to see this band thing and see how it pans out. And in my mind, I was like, dude, if this doesn't work, I'm out of here. Yeah. You know, and then, uh, the band thing didn't work, but I ended up meeting the woman who became my wife. So that changed uh, everything. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I was like, I love Toronto. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so once once that band kind of broke up, I, I decided to go to school in um, in Mississauga for uh, audio engineering and production to, to, to learn how to become a music producer. And I did. And um, there I met, you know, people who I would then join in as, as like my, my band and started touring the country and releasing music and just doing all that stuff. And it's, it's been a great ride. And you know, the singer in my current band is the guy I met way back then. It's that was in okay. 20, 2011. And yeah, so I, I started making records and I started producing other artists. Um, and that became my, my actual day job, so to speak, you know, if you can even call it a job. Yeah. Um, and it's been awesome. I've been super, super fortunate to, to call that my my actual bread and butter. And then, like Andrew said, in 2018, uh, one of the people that I work with, Andre Kid and Black, he met Andrew and said, like, you know, there's this guy. He does kind of like this folky thing. Um, we're going to make a record with him. I was like, great. And we met up. And immediately when I met Andrew, I said, you have a vibe of somebody who just came back from a big trip. You you went somewhere around the world. You've seen some things. You're into nature. It's like, yeah, I was actually in Australia, and I'm into snowboarding and I'm into skateboarding and you know and all that stuff. And I was like, all right, cool, we're gonna get along. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and it was like you know every session it was like talking about all these things and surfing came up, and at the time. I was just kind of uh, just before that. I, I, I've I've heard maybe around 2016. I heard about this thing about Great Lake surfing, and I was like, "That does not make sense to me." Are they talking about like paddle boarding or like skiing or like what? What is <laughs> you know what's what's surfing? It's it's lakes. So I kind of just didn't even you can't surf on the lake. No, well, that's what I thought. Yeah. And so I didn't really even engage with the idea, but, um, uh, in 2017, I went to the Dominican just for like a vacation and I ended up surfing there because I found like this, this little, um, beach where you could do it. And they, they came to pick us up and, you know, so I, I, as Google does, when you search for things, it collects the data and starts suggesting things to you. Oh. Yeah. that you're interested in so you know all that uh data collection worked in my favor because when i came back to toronto i started seeing all these like instagram 
suggestions like surf Toronto, surf the Great, surf Ontario, you know, Great Lake surfing. And I was like, what the hell is any of this? Like, what do you mean surf Toronto? You, you guys are out of your minds. There's no such thing. And then I started seeing these photos and I was like, wait, that does look like Toronto. That does look like the lakes. Either it's photoshopped or I'm, you know, or this is something real. So I, <laughs> I started looking into it and I kind of read somewhere that it's wind dependent. And yeah. one day, yeah, one day I just told my wife, I said, like, listen, um, let's take a drive to Bluffers Park. I heard that when the wind is good, I didn't even know what direction or anything. I just yeah. heard that when it's very windy, they get waves. So she's like, sure, cool. So we went and surely enough, I walked onto the water and i saw people surfing and i was like oh my god this is real like and yeah and then a little bit more research i came across the guys from surf the greats and uh went to the shop in july of i think 20 i think it was 2018 because you're you're ringing a bell for me now because i remember yeah. us probably i think we started working together in like june or maybe may of 2018 and yeah. we somehow got on the topic of just like surfing and i was yeah, like oh yeah i've tr tried to get into it on the lakes like way back in 2015 but i like i had a board and i didn't know where to go and i just like got out of it and you're like you started talking about it and i think it was like literally a week after that the next session you're like yo i rented a board and I rented a wetsuit and it was so sick, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think I think it was 2018. It must have been July or something then. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was in July 2018. I went to Surf the Greats, rented a big ass foamy, and uh paddled out at Ashbridge's Bay and caught waves. And I was like, okay, here goes all my free time. <laughs> so yeah, that's man. that. You know, and after that, I think what happened was with Andrew is that he uh, ended up getting a board and uh, he texted me one day after we haven't spoken for a while. And he was like, hey, man, I got a board. Next time we're going surfing. Let's go. And I was like, you're damn right. That's what we're doing. And uh, so what was your first board? Um, <laughs> yeah, Tao would Tao would have more memories on that. I don't know. What'd you get first, Tao? I got uh, some guy brought a bat board from Florida and sold it on Kijiji for 150 bucks. It was a six eight landmark, which that I was a landy. Heard. That was a landy, yeah. Oh, that was such a great board, man. It, it's it's basically a boat. It was really really thick, uh, but it caught anything, literally anything. So it was a really really good board to start with. And Andrew at the time had a. Uh, a five six wave bandit that he got like a foamy yeah 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 i think i i was like working this event back when i was doing like my part-time gig and they were using a wave bandit as a prop and after the event i was like what are you guys doing with the wave bandit <laughs> and they were kind of like it's broken and they just like <laughs> winked at me nodded their head and i'm like yeah okay i'll go throw it out and uh that was my first surf now actually that's not true that was my second surfboard because i back in 2015 wanted to get into lake surfing because i had heard about it so i did some research and there was there, there was a guy selling wave storms out of a storage container mm. um in like oshawa or something like that so in 2015 i like took my parents a Toyota Sienna van and I like drove out to Oshawa and paid like 200 bucks for an eight foot wave storm and then I remember I like kept it in the car for the whole summer anytime I'd be like near a lake I'd be like just in case it happens like <laughs> it never did though I remember I like went on this soul searching trip like out to I are you living in are you around like uh, a Wenda Park is that near Kind of where you're at now, Derek? I'm living in Owen Sound, so I'm close to Georgian Bay and Lake Huron. I, th I think that's a Wend. Oh, yeah, Wenda's on, on Georgian Bay. And I okay. went to like the Wenda area and I was like, I was camping by the lake. I had my board with me. And like, 
it would have been like September. I had no wetsuit or anything like that or October. I don't know what I was thinking. I was just like, I'm getting waves this weekend, man. It never happened. And that's kind of the weekend after that. I think I sold the wave storm <laughs> and it was like four years until I got the wave bandit <laughs> from work, Amazing. which wasn't the greatest learning board. Yeah. Uh, I must add. There's this thing about surfing though. I mean, if you've done it once or twice, that sort of qualifies someone to consider themselves a surfer. And then if they don't ride away for another couple of years, it almost doesn't matter because it consumes you regardless. You know, you're just waiting for that, that opportunity when it's going to happen. So, so you were a surfer already. You just hadn't exactly found your, your niche and your, your group yet. Yeah. I yeah. think it was, it's interesting because the great lakes have actually turned me into feeling like an actual surfer now, mm -hmm. because I had, I was in Australia for a year, pretty much surfing, like, you know, all the time at least at one point I was going like in the morning before work and that sort of thing. But I was terrible, man. I had no buddies that were surfing. I, I didn't really try to dive into the community because I felt kind of like a bit of an outcast being like this Canadian dude trying to surf there. So I didn't, I didn't really improve at it there, which is now I'm looking back and I'm like, damn dude, I could have got so good in that year. And then I, I have a family in Hawaii. So I've been there a couple of times too. And I've, I've actually surfed in Hawaii as well. And I was terrible. And now I'm like dying to go back because it's now I've had a couple of seasons on the lakes and I just want to go ride some queen, clean longboard waves in, in Hawaii. But it wasn't until yeah. the Great Lakes where I kind of was like, all right, I think I could say I'm a surfer now. Absolutely. Like, Where's the family in Hawaii? Which island? Uh, my aunt, uncle, and cousin live uh, just, I guess it would be west of Waikiki. Oh, perfect. So they're, yeah, they're on Oahu. So I've, the last time I was there, last couple of times I was there, I just went out with my cousin and paddle out on the south shore there, the Waikiki waves, and I was yeah. horrible. I don't even know if I caught like a real wave that day. Mind you, I was like on a beater, like, yeah a short beater and i was like way too heavy for it my cousin though he was like 12 at the time just shredding i was so yeah. embarrassed it's pretty crowded there anyway it's a little hard to catch waves there if you're there in tourist season anyway yeah um i don't think north i sure is uh and unfortunately in the summertime the north shore is not really yeah not i've well either i've been interested because i've been researching like the other islands because the other islands look like they're actually more a little little bit more realistic for a good surf trip for someone at my level right now mm. but the south shore yeah waikiki gets super busy but it's it's not intimidating like you don't have jamie o'brien and all the guys from the north shore coming down to waikiki to to surf at least all the time true, yeah. so it's kind of just everyone out there is just taking a crack at it which is there's something inviting about that but yeah. uh the north shore yeah I, i'm not i'm not too familiar with how it works there i've i've watched a couple competitions there i don't think i'll ever paddle out there uh unless i get really 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 yeah. good somehow man thank god for the uh i don't know if necessarily the invention but the popularity these days of soft tops and foamies because I can remember, you know, places like Waikiki and places like Tofino 10 years ago, you know, and you got guys wiping out on fiberglass boards everywhere. It can be pretty dangerous. I found these last few years, you know, you just see this, uh, a whole bunch of blue boards out there. Kind of makes you feel a little better. You know, those projectiles <laughs> coming at you are a, a little, a little lighter when they connect. Well, I, I agree. I think there's, uh, you know, I'm, definitely but i'm by no means a, an advanced surfer but i'm i can surf i i can i can handle myself in most situations and uh you know there's a there's an increase of of, of beginners out in the in the lakes you know especially in uh like in ashbridge's bay or sometimes in you know pleasant beach in lake erie and um i'm very thankful that they're on soft tops i, I got a few to the head and a few kind of ran me over and i was like ah it's just a soft top it's whatever man it's it's all good 
But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah there have been some hairy situations. There is actually, I, I don't know who this person is, and but there's somebody who once paddled out to the cove in uh, in Bluffers Park in a pink soft top, apparently. It's like one of those, like, you know, words in the community, and, and that person had no place being there, like no business being that place, and just put everybody in danger because he was like dropping in on people and like falling over and uh, you know Derek you haven't been to the cove or at least not recently but it's it's a spot that's very like if you don't know what you're doing do not paddle out to that spot it's rocky bottom the waves are punchy um it's you know it's very very easy to t- to get caught inside and just get worked so you know, <laughs> so okay. I'm always looking for that, that, you know, that ginger beard guy in the, in the pink foamy, just in case he <laughs> pulls out on a big day to stay away from him. <laughs> yeah, true enough. Right on. I, I was thinking, Tal, a little bit about when you said you landed in Vancouver and mm-hmm. then you went to Toronto of all places. So I recently, you know, left Vancouver and I came here and it turns out I had no idea, but I landed in Owen Sound which is referred to as the elephant's asshole in Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at a map, um, I encourage you to look at a map, actually. You'll the see that uh, southwestern Ontario, actually, let me pull it up here too to, to better describe it. I Eric, think they're talking can about I just this. ask who is referring to Owen Sound as the elephant's asshole of Ontario? People up here. <laughs> yeah, oh, people who live here. Yeah, they, you know, they're not all big fans. But if you look at southern Ontario and look at uh like Windsor and Essex County and all that, imagine that as the elephant's trunk. And then if you're looking at where Hamilton and Buffalo are, imagine that as the front leg. And then Markham and whatnot would be one of the back legs. Um but imagine the Bruce Peninsula as the tail. And then you'll see. Uh, you... Yeah, okay. I see it. You just have to hold it sideways. Yeah, right where it went down. Is... Oh, I do see that. That is the anus. <laughs> wow. Who would have so, known, man? Yeah, so hey, man, you could have ended up in the <laughs> elephant's <laughs> asshole, but you didn't. You ended up in Toronto. So right on for you, dude. So, you know, living in Vancouver for 12 years, yeah, it is. The music scene there is awesome. The music that comes out of there is awesome. But you really got to sort of work to find it. And I can't even imagine trying to break through over there. That's for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, um, the biggest problem that you face living in Vancouver is that touring is is very, very difficult for us as Canadian artists. It's, you know, it's, it's a big ask to actually get visas to tour the States. And it's actually over the years, I think it's become more and more difficult. So, you know, from Vancouver, you have to drive. I think the next part, next town you really can hit up is like Kelowna. And then I've I've done it. Like I've, I've toured, uh, twice cross country in in 2017. We were with uh, big wreck. Um, Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. So we played, you know, and like the tour started in Nanaimo. So we drove five days from, you know, from Toronto all the way to Nanaimo, like with the ferry and everything. Yeah, and yeah. Um, you really get to see the the distances that involve that. Whereas here, you know, in Ontario, at least you've got like the 401 stretch where it's like you've got all these, you know, cities you can hit up and you've got, you know, Quebec is not too far. And if you do end up going to the States, well, you've got New York right underneath you. So it's a little bit better. There's more people, there's more industry, but again, not to take anything away from British Columbia, I mean, in the, in in terms of producers and studios and some of the most legendary um, music to ever come out of Canada. I mean, Brian Adams, you know, his his studio is out in Vancouver in the the warehouse studios, and it's unbelievable. Some unbelievable music came out of there. And um, yeah, I think he's in Gastown. I've been told he's on Water Street. Uh, I don't know. I've never actually been to the studio. It's one of those like bucket list items for me. Yeah. But uh, yeah, for sure, there's been some incredible music, incredible music producers who came out of uh, Vancouver. I mean, you know, you've got uh, Garth Richardson who did like 
Rage Against the Machine's first record, and he did, yeah, like he he's done quite a few big records. And then you've got Bob Rock, who I believe is from yeah. Vancouver as well, you know, who freaking did Bon Jovi and Metallica and all these things. So it's not like Vancouver doesn't have a legacy of uh, of huge, you know, musical influence on you know on a world level, but. You know, in recent years, it just hasn't been that same hub that Southern Ontario is. Yeah. Man, traveling with Big Wreck, I can't, you know, the energy. Uh, I once saw some of the members at Big Wreck when I was living in Toronto. There was some bar we went to on Queen Street and they were playing, you know, what's that song? The one that is, uh, I really love that tune. It's called That Song. That Song. Okay. That's what I thought. The energy, the energy that that song produced, wow, it was electric. So I can't imagine traveling with those guys. They must have closed out with that song quite a bit. Uh, they, they don't close out with that song. They uh, they close out with, uh, well, I, sh- I sh- probably shouldn't give it away because <laughs> we go to see a show. It's yeah. not, they don't close out with that song, but it's, it's on every show. It's definitely one of my favorites. Um, I was extremely fortunate to, you know, to tour with them back, back then. And, uh, this was, uh, yeah, 2017 Ian, Ian is, I mean, not just Ian, the whole band is awesome, but you know, for me as a guitar player, nerding out with Ian, you know, talking guitars was incredible. Seeing him play every night is incredible. Same as the rest of the band. And, uh, it was really nice to, to, to just experience that with them. They're, one of those bands that makes you feel like you're just not like, why am I doing this? Why oh. it's, like, it's like, if you, I don't know, for me, if I paddled out anywhere and I s- suddenly saw Dane Reynolds, I'd be like, all right, I'm, I'm paddling out. Like yeah. <laughs> I, I shouldn't be here. If he's here and he's going to surf, I'm just going to sit there and watch. But uh, you know, that's, that's what they say to do, man. They say to surf or skate with people that are better than you. And same thing with music. Cause that's how you get good. Right Fair on. enough. Fair enough. What's that expression? Uh, you know, something I forget, like rubbing off, like, what is it? Rust or metal or there's an expression. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with it, but okay. I, I think. <laughs> okay. I guess I'll edit that <laughs> shit up. <laughs> I, yeah, think, it, oh. I think being in the proximity of, of people who are really good at what they do definitely rubs off on you and whatever, you know, whatever energy they bring with them is definitely something that if you, if you're open to it and you understand it, you can take with you and it'll, you'll definitely learn something from it. I've, I've learned luckily from, from very, very talented and, and proven musicians and very grateful for it. Yeah. You know, and I've noticed too, like, we get all in our head but other people don't care like when's the last time you looked at someone else and thought oh man i'm so much better at this than you are like no you're no. you're encouraging people you're seeing like a young musician you want to help them you don't want to slight them right yeah i i agree and i think the same goes for surfing you know yeah. i mean and if anything in the great lakes especially i've i've noticed that it's a very Compared to other places I've surfed, um, it's a very, very welcoming and supportive community. I can't say I've met a person in the lineup who wasn't nice. Mm, yeah. Andrew? Yeah, very welcoming, man. Like, I think that's the most encouraging part about Great Lakes surfing is kind of everyone understands that it's like you're just out there for, for fun and because you love it. So everyone's kind of on this wavelength where they're just like, trying to help everyone else out. And I mean, you still got that spot hiding thing mentality that every surfer does, but yeah, for everyone's super nice out on the lakes and yeah, it's a good time, man. I don't ever feel like I have to, I don't know, watch out for, I don't know. I used to paddle out. I remember at first when I was first paddling out to the lineup, I'd be like, Hey man, how's it going? Yeah. You might want to get away from me. I'm really shit. I might kill you. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And, and they're just laughing it's like oh no man don't worry about it and then 10 minutes later they get a board to the head and they're like all right <laughs> yeah, they're still never happened you, right yeah no no one's like i i got that vibe in australia a bit like 
I think it was only like my second or third time out. I was at Bondi and like dudes were getting pissed that I was trying to paddle out and, you know, maybe shouldn't be there, but you know, you don't get that vibe here on the lakes, which is, which is super encouraging and it helps you get better because you don't feel bad for being there. You know what I mean? That's half the thing. I think that's why when I initially first started going out with towel, I was like super like not down to paddle out to the lineup because i'm like i don't know man i don't want to upset anyone and like get in their way and i don't know what's going on here so i just like hang out on the inside but once you kind of realize that everyone's super nice here and it's just like you're surfing on a lake dude like we're all in this together (laughs) i was just gonna say that this this in a way great lake surfing is still sort of in its infancy in a way and we're all in this together we're all figuring it out so drop the hierarchy no one's really sort of above anyone else here i would say so you know i've only been back for geez a couple months and man i've never felt so welcomed into something before and i've i've hardly even met anybody in person yet but just the (laughs) online community alone has been totally open arms to me and uh sort of welcoming me back home it's it's fantastic. I think we got something really special here, actually, in terms of the surf community. And I don't know how it compares to the rest of the world, but I think because, you know, our numbers are probably, you know, relatively low compared to, you know, any big city on an ocean coast. So we're pretty fortunate that way. But I think I think one day, you know, 50 years, 100 years from now, I think it's going to be a lot more mainstream even than it is now. So we, yep. uh, we also got to kind of enjoy this time for what it is as well. Absolutely. I, I, yeah, I totally agree. And uh, I think, you know, to, to, to speak to the, the whole idea of like how we're all in this together and it's a very like, there's no hierarchy. There's none of that. I mean, I look at guys like Larry, for example, Larry Cavero, who, who's an awesome surfer and he rips. And there are other guys who I've seen in the water surfing, you know, and, and it's never... There's never a, a shred of like, you know, condescending behavior or anything like that. It's all love. It's all just like, hey man, like, ch- check that one out. Come in. Are you going? Oh, sh- you, no, no, you go, you go. Like, it's 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 not. There's no fighting over stuff. When a, somebody accidentally drops in on you, it's like, all right, buddy, party wave. It's it's just, yeah. it's yeah. It's a very very positive environment, and I think. It also stems from the fact that when we do go into the winter months and, you know, the, the population dwindles down a bit, we're all, that's when you really kind of feel that whole, like, all right, we're going into the freezing waters together. Everybody, yeah. you know, yeah. look, and, and you really feel that like everybody's looking to make sure, oh, nobody, absolutely. you know, nobody's missing. <laughs> that's oh, when yeah, you right. must really feel that brotherhood or, sisterhood that's when you really feel that connection hey eh? you really are looking out for each other i think so yeah yeah so i want to go back a little bit to the music and uh i wanted to find out who your musical influences are you start andrew yes i think i always end up circling back to the same thing and i've done a couple interviews and podcasts lately where i had to talk about this and i still think i feel like it's the same thing i always say but i i think i got super into it when that whole mtv unplugged thing started coming into play and um okay and i really enjoyed that where the punk artists would go and play acoustic guitars Mm. and do that sort of thing that really spoke to me i i liked punk music like pop punk specifically back in the day and all my buddies were into that. So I, I kind of was just, you know, in, in it as well. I was just there for the ride. But really, I like the more acoustic s- stuff. So that started really, really speaking to me. There was this band called Never Shout Never at the time. They were kind of like the acoustic band on the Warp Tour. Okay. Um, wasn't hardcore at all. And <laughs> there'd be some dudes that probably would make fun of you for watching it so i was always kind of like sneaking through the crowd at the show like this I think times have changed but uh i like this band called never show never i would say that was a huge influence on my music at the start never show never never shout never never shout never okay never shout very, never check it out 
Yeah, I don't know if they're still around. I haven't seen those dudes for a little while. <laughs> okay. um, but I, of course, City and Color was a huge, huge City. influence as well. There we go, City and Color. I was going to say, like, the music you're talking about, to me, it sounds like, is that what people kind of describe as emo? Like, sort of? Yeah, I mean... What's the band that sang that song, uh, Vindicated? Do you know Tao? I'm not sure if I'm familiar with that. Uh, I, I don't think so. Oh, I'm... man. <laughs> Jeez. A, a simple Spotify search would do it for um, us. Yeah. The vindicated. The name of the band, but these guys. Oh, Dashboard, Dashboard Confessional. Confessional. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, like it, like their sound. Wow, that was when that when I first heard, you know, that unique sound of theirs. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I think it was kind of that scene that really inspired me to get into playing music and writing music myself. Like, what is quite weird because when I was younger, the the super like I was born in '95, so growing up, the popular music at the time when I was kind of like an early teenager was rap music. And hip hop, okay. so people were getting like into like listening to Biggie Smalls and Eminem and Lil Wayne and like all those guys I, that were doing that sort of thing. So I was playing hockey at the time, and you know you'd go into a locker room and everyone have their their newest beat in the playlist, like you know. And that was when Drake was starting to come up as well. So I think that's what I initially was listening to as a kid. It wasn't like folk music or punk music or anything like that. So. Well, that when, might you play. Uh, when you mentioned MTV Unplugged, my mind instantly went to Nirvana. But yeah. that would have been even like a, a year or so before you were born, probably. That yeah, Nirvana and I mean, Unplugged album was. That was that's the vibe. That's the vibe, though. You, you definitely nailed it. Like, that's the whole thing, right? Like a heavier sounding band or a more, more full sounding band doing that same thing on acoustic guitar. Oh, okay. Was, was kind of what did it for me. And. And I, that's what got me City in Color and Never Show Never really wanted, really made me want to learn that that music and get on the acoustic guitar. And it was so much more accessible than plugging an electric guitar into an amp and pissing off your parents and sounding bad for the whole neighborhood. Okay. So the acoustic guitar route, you know, I feel like everyone has an acoustic guitar sitting around their house when they're kids. So I, I did. And just like Talon, I was lucky enough that I could just, pick it up and youtube was really taken off at the time so there's some tutorials on there and ultimate tabs was a hero for me and uh, eventually i ended up doing lessons and all that sort of thing because i got more into it but yeah i'd say city and color never show never that whole acoustic warp tour thing really played a huge influence in getting me started in music and i still listen to those those bands to this day so and your generation like you want to learn something just youtube it like youtube could be your dad like how do i shave watch youtube there's an account for that there's a channel literally like it's called like hey dad question really? yeah yeah man there's everything i mean like i i you know people will crack a joke at me for this but i'd say i was just slightly ahead of that generation okay i mean there definitely wasn't all these YouTube learning videos and vloggers and YouTube stars and all that stuff out at the time when I was a teenager. Yeah. It was more like crappy DV videos of you skateboarding and that type of shit like that. That wasn't, I don't know if the whole tutorial thing was super popular yet, but there was like, there'd be people who would go like in their shitty, like MacBook camera. All right, this is how you play the girl by city and color and you'd be like trying to freaking see their fingers through the pixelated camera but it, it helped for sure and it has grown into a thing where yeah man like i see du dudes doing like renos on their house with their laptop on a table like with a youtube tutorial on it and i'm like mm, anything electrical definitely i would be not trusting a youtube tutorial by myself so i don't know oh, wow but you're absolutely right with that. It's going to be a thing where everyone just is going to rely on that. <laughs> like, do what I mean, YouTube told me to do. Yeah. Well, yeah. And think about it too. With I, I, I'm constantly thinking about what's going to happen with school now because of how everything's changing with COVID. 
Mm. I'm, I'm wondering what's going to happen with school in the future. Is school going to be a thing? Or is it going to be like weird when I'm like 50 or 60 and then kids are like, wow, you went to school every day. That's so weird. It's like, you know what I mean? Like it could very well change the way that society works school wise. Now, like kids might do like internet classes once every other day for like five or six years and then go do a trade or something. Who knows? Right. Like it's, it could evolve into a thing where you just like go on YouTube and do whatever the hell you want. I don't know, man. Hey, tell, I want to know, man, who were your musical influences? Um, well, my musical influences were basically whatever my parents were listening to. I mean, they, you know, when I was when I was growing up, my my family loved music. Um, none of them actually played music, but they would always listen to, uh, like, they loved Eric Clapton and they loved Dire Straits, and you know. And then my dad had a very strange uh, love for the Pavarotti and Friends album. So <laughs> driving places and my dad is just like, oh, yeah. And it's like, oh, I love you. And then Brian Adams like, i do anything for you. He's like, i do anything for you. Oh. Like, <laughs> so that was like, you know, that was my childhood's, uh, um, you know, soundtrack. <laughs> but, uh, when I started playing guitar, I got my, my teacher was like, oh, you got to listen to Jimi Hendrix. And I was like. Mm-hmm. Okay, sure. So I went and bought, you know, the Jimi Hendrix experience. And I was like, that's how you do it. Okay. And I think, you know, after that, I kind of really got into like heavier and heavier music. It was, you know, from Nirvana into Metallica into like super like out there, really heavy and, you know, frightening metal that, you know, people thought I was into some bad shit, which I wasn't. I was a complete nerd. I just, you know. Yeah. had long hair but uh yeah and, and that that was kind of it but throughout that time i've always also liked you know sting and and the police and you know the, that that kind of and queen so i think those were the kind of the classic classic rock bands in that sense were always some somewhere around me and you know i to this day listen to Jimi hendrix all the time listen to eric clapton all the time they're they're just one of those, they're those characters that it's like you, you can't make sense of modern music without taking what they've done into yeah. consideration. So, absolutely. Yeah. So, these bands you're mentioning, these are all American bands. I mean, what was yeah. the scene like in Israel? Is there some mainstream music from there that you were into? Or <laughs> you're smiling, it's like it's a whole damn country. They must have produced something. Dude, I ask Tal this question all the time, man. <laughs> well, uh, so th- there, there is. Here's the funny thing about Israel: there's a, a crazy amount of talent in Israel. Like the the actual musicianship and the level of your average musician who actually does it for real is super high, and people are really, really good at what they do, and they they pride themselves in that because it's a very small country, and things get competitive really quickly. Um, there, there's something that I, I truly like about Israel is the fact that there's a very st- straightforward, no bullshit kind of thing. If you suck, people will tell you you suck. <laughs> <laughs> there's no, like, that was a great set, man. The p- people will just look at you like, what the fuck are you doing on stage, man? Like, uh, you shouldn't be here. So, okay. I mean, you need a bit of that. You need a bit of that. Cause you won't improve. For sure, but there's also something to be said about positive <laughs> support, you know, like people being positive uh, reinforcement, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, the scene right now, I mean, if if you want to be a professional musician who makes a living, uh, making music in Israel, you probably need to be making music in Hebrew. And I okay. have many friends who, you know, they were very fortunate to be to become professional musicians in Israel who are, you know, playing shows, recording albums. But it's all in Hebrew, and there's, you know, you're only, you're, you're limited, you know, within your reach to just a, a certain market and also a certain amount of shows per year. I don't know if you're aware of the uh, geographical challenges that Israel has, but basically touring out of Israel anywhere within our borders is basically impossible because our neighbors are not really into us. So, yeah. you know, hopefully that'll change in the future. But uh, as as it stands right now, we're... You know, we're not going to be playing shows in Lebanon anytime soon. So, you know, 
so that's kind of uh that's where that ends but i do have to say specifically for me when i you know when i was like in my late teens early 20s i was very much in the metal scene there and that's the scene that's very very established and uh you know the punk scene as well you've got a couple of bands who are you know who tour the world and have you know international recording you know contracts and 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 accolades there's uh there's a band called useless id that are uh, on uh fat wreck um the that label by it by uh was no effects i think um and they've I, i've seen them play here like in hamilton nice. because yeah because they're they're gaining some some real good traction and you've got a lot of metal bands and hardcore bands that have made it you know they've toured europe i personally produced a band called hammer cult that did you know really really big things in europe and they're very successful for a while so it does exist like there's a really really good music scene but it's just um unless it's a very niche market that that you know markets itself elsewhere their lifespan in israel is not very long because they're just kind of stuck within the confines of a small country where you can't really play more than kind of 10 shows a year yeah wow so okay so not many jewish musical influences got it no <laughs> not <at all. laughs> i'm sure there's actually tons of the guys that we're yeah. talking about are jewish <laughs> absolutely yeah oh yeah i bet some of the mainstream bands for sure so <laughs> kadima you know we talked a bit about you know whaley and your your sound and your influences now kadima you know, I was checking this sound out and it is awesome, but I do not know how to describe it. I mean, I'm like, is this rock or is this, I can't quite put my finger on it. <laughs> um, well, I think that the, um, the big umbrella term is rock. And okay. um, if you listen to the whole record that we put out this year, it definitely has moments where it's very much undeniably rock, but then a lot of the stuff is not so much rock. It might be a bit more quirky and interesting, and that's kind of how we like to keep it. It's uh, uh, my singer Jimmy and I were, you know, we listen to a lot of different types of music, and we definitely making this album. We wanted to be able to create a sound that can allow us to go if we want super loud and aggressive, or super soft and and quiet and whatever we want, and I think that's kind of what ended up happening and we're, yeah, we're happy with it. It's, it's just, you know, it's, there's a lot of humor in what we do. It's I've not, noticed that, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not like a, when I say humor, we're not a stand up comedian duo, but there's, it's, it's just kind of sarcastic, you know, a sarcastic way of dealing with our lives and anything that life throws at us. We just kind of, make fun of it and sing and dance through it. And that's, that's kind of our, uh, our mentality. Nice. So what about Kadima or Tal Weissman and Whaley? You know, where do the, where do the lines cross here? Are we going to see some kind of collaboration or, you know, what does that look like? That's a great question. I think, well, I mean, I would say that Tal had a huge part in, definitely shaping Whaley to, to what it is today. And we're still actively working together, writing music and, and we're in the studio recording new stuff. So in that sense, Tal and I will probably be doing a bunch of stuff together, but I think mainly because of our surf relationship, there may be some collaborations in the future with Whaley and Kadima. It's they're completely different worlds, but I think it might work. I mean, we've had some, conversations out in the lineup with the surf the greats guys and i think there could be something cool to be done there um because there's they're definitely huge supporters of the community and music and great guys so who knows man i don't know there, there could be something funky coming uh down the line sometime soon you never know right on i feel Good. like there's uh some foreshadowing going on there. <laughs> Well, I mean, can't say too much, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're working on something. Um, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> so, hey, oh, I know. Hey, Permastoke theme song, guys. There you go. You know what? That, uh, you got it. Right. I think we should do that. Done. We're doing that. All hey, right. yeah, I would love sick. it. 
I have us on record. But uh, I would love to get some original music from you guys for sure. I think we could do that, man. That's Tao's specialty, at least. And well, I'd love to, to hop in on that and do, do something funky. Well, we know what we're doing next, Andrew. So I'm l- looking forward to it very much. I'm a podcast addict and uh, nothing better than listening to podcasts about surfing because, you know, I honestly learn so much, but it's also nice to hear about, you know, people that you you share a, a passion with and hear about their lives and how they got into it and how they deal with it. So it's cool. Yeah, and you know what I've been finding that I love is the common thread everyone has. You know, these it's it's no matter who I talk to, it's spiritual for everyone. It's a spiritual life changing situation. Like it it just changes everybody. And so you can't help but listen to these stories and walk away feeling reinvigorated, even more stoked yourself. So that's what, that's what I'm really loving about it. And so many of the same stories, you know, a guy goes down to the lake, starts surfing, everyone's looking at him like, you're nuts, you can't surf the Great Lakes, but yet we do. Here we are. We're here to stay. You are not getting rid of us. I was, uh, uh, b- before I moved into the house that I'm in now, uh, for about seven years, I, I lived in... Um, in Regent Park in Toronto. And like, so the first two years I, I didn't have a car when I was going surfing, I would Uber to the beach. I would literally have <laughs> an Uber come pick me up with my giant board. Half of them would just drive away. And I would, I'd be like, no, 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 I can, I can fit in your car. Come on, man. Like anyways, I would be waiting outside. It'd be snowing or raining or just basically crappy weather. And always some like, you know, a person on the street will walk next to me and I don't know if you know Regent Park in Toronto, but it's a bit of a questionable area, at least okay. used to be back then. And, uh, you know, some um, half in the bag person would walk. <laughs> <to see me. laughs> like, What's that? I'm like, it's a, it's a surfboard. Where are you going surfing, bud? You're not in California. I, was like, uh, I, I don't have time to explain this whole thing to you right now, man. But like, OK, and that would be like pretty much every time. So. Yeah. Yeah, dude, I love the old guy commentary when you're like in the parking lot and it's like, what do you be careful out there? Or just like the <laughs> dumbest shit always. You're just having like, <laughs> just makes you laugh. I don't know. I've been lectured about not wearing a uh, life jacket before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's come up. So guys, I mean, I can't help but notice, you know, the elephant in the room here we're in covid guys you guys are musicians i mean what the hell are you doing during covid you're not you're not doing the concert thing i imagine mm, no nope. no andrew oh. had 70 something shows booked for the year oh brother and uh yeah no shows man i've done a couple recently just like small little library things i've done like two or three just out at places that that i know and have a good relationship with but they've been super just like nonchalant kind of relaxed things just go hang out and drink some craft beer yeah but no shows man it's it's been super weird it's been a lot of uh creation time you could say whether it's business wise or a music wise whatever it is it's it's been a lot of back-end stuff I mean, because you're really starting to gain traffic this year, like gain some momentum this year, and then this shit goes down. Well, I'd say actually for me, for Whaley at least, COVID is the main reason why Whaley is even out right now. I mean, I was still sitting on the on the idea of what Whaley was going to be okay. in in March, and uh, I was on tour performing under my name, doing the Americana thing. And uh, March comes, and I remember it was like March 12th. We had a show on the 13th, and on the 12th, like they locked down everything, and our show got canceled on the 13th. And then on the Saturday and Sunday, it also got canceled, and all of our shows were canceled. I was like, "Holy crap, dude! What what's going on here?" Like that was when it was first coming in, and I think right away in my head, I was like, "All right, well, I'm gonna have a lot of time on my hands now, so." let's get this Whaley project rolling. So if anything, COVID was helpful to that in that sense, where it gave me a lot of, a lot of time. Otherwise, yeah, Tao was right. I had about 70 shows 
for this summer tour. And then that tour that I was tail ending in March was like 35 shows. We had about 15 left. So there, it would have been super busy for me. I wouldn't have been able to, to get Whaley going. And I'm super happy that, that I did have the time to do it. But at the same time, it's been super tough because it's an, it's always an unorthodox approach to things now. Yeah. And it's, you don't get the payoff of going and playing a show and, meeting people and, and seeing the in-person, you know, reaction to everything that you're doing. But yeah. I think there's something to be said about adapting and overcoming what we're going through right now. So I, I guess that's what you have to do right now. If you want to continue being an artist and um, yeah, I'm just very fortunate. So I'm, I'm thankful for that, but Tao, yeah, I think. Yeah can probably shed some light on what it's been like in the music industry. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, you know, I sort of like my, my current band Kadima was, uh, we released our first single in December and we were very much, you know, we played a couple of acoustic sets and then in February we played our first like live electric band kind of set. It went really well. We were so stoked about, what's to come you know we were like all right man like things are going great this show went really well and our agent was booking us a bunch of stuff and there's you know there's like a a couple of summer festival spots and just you know everything was lining up and then boom you know everything got shut down and at first i was like well you know at least we have that summer festival date still there you know it'll it'll open up by then and that just kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed until everything was canceled. And I was like, Oh my God, like this is going to be really bad. And, um, I, you know what, like for me as a band member, as a guy who plays shows, um, I, yeah, I feel bad and it's, it's obviously a bummer and you know, it's, it's nothing in comparison to the people whose livelihood comes from being, you know, sound engineers and lighting technicians and stagehands and club owners and you name it. Like there's an entire industry that is collapsing. I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but like clubs in Toronto left, right and center are closing down. Like they're Uh going under, um, legendary places that are, you know, just, just, just monuments, cultural monuments. And they're going down because, you know, people can't keep, the the, the the lights on because they have nothing no income whatsoever okay. no and there's nothing in sight there's no date we don't we don't know when, when it's going to come back we're just seeing a rise in numbers now so who knows when the next time that 50 to 100 people will be allowed indoors together um it's just yeah it's it's a very grim situation to be honest for for the industry itself for the people okay. who you know who are not on stage. The people who are on stage obviously suffer as well. I mean, if you think of like, uh, we're lucky both, both, you know, Whaley and Kadima are relatively new projects where there wasn't, you know, an insane amount of financial investment to get things moving in, in terms of marketing and touring and all that stuff. But, you know, some of the bigger bands who just went to the studio and recorded an album for hundreds of thousands or whatever, and then put, another couple of hundreds of thousands in, in, in tour promotion and all that stuff, all that money's gone down the drain and there's nobody to get it back from. And it's, it's pretty grim. I'm honestly, you know, I, I try to keep positive and luckily again, surfing's been a, we've been doing a hell of a lot of surfing, man. Yeah. Like honest to goodness. I, I think there was a point where we were going three times a week. Yeah. It and thank God Mother Nature just brought us waves this summer, dude. Because yeah. otherwise, yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah, but I don't know. I, uh, there's something. Sorry, Derek. Sorry, go, ahead. go ahead, dude. No, you go. I'm just gonna tail that and say there's something uh, to say about timing, and we just I think both Kadima and Whaley just were lucky to have the timing right with what we were doing with our projects because yeah. I think we both had uh, content that was all lined up, ready to go. Right on right before COVID happened. So it was just, just good timing for us. Otherwise who knows? Cause it's, it's very difficult to, you know, to, to create content right now um, yeah. with all the restrictions. And if you're trying to do that, it's, it doesn't always go as planned. So we just, yeah. I think timing had a lot to do with our 
particular uh, spot yeah. in life right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm with you guys. I uh, If it weren't for COVID, to be honest with you, I wouldn't be rocking and rolling as much as I am right now either. COVID really gave me the, the time and space to also get creative, get this podcast off the ground, my brand, Freshwater Surf, get things that were kind of sitting dormant. Finally, I had the time to do. And, and if you go back and listen to that first episode, when I'm talking to Larry, I it was just hopes and dreams that I'd be coming back to Ontario and here I am. So I actually am pretty thankful to COVID for that, but now it's getting to the point where we're watching the second wave come and you know, more and more people dying. It's like, okay, this uh, it's starting to, you know, I'm starting to try to compartmentalize my positive effects because it has done such detriment to, to so many people too, but yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, Kadima, what does that mean? I, I read something there. That's a Hebrew word for what exactly? Uh, so Kadima is actually the, the name of my hometown oh, okay. in Israel. But uh, the actual meaning of the word is forward. Oh, okay. Um, and it's funny because that wasn't my idea to name the band Kadima. It was one of those brainstorming sessions and somebody said, Hey, Tal, what's, you know, what's your hometown's name in, in Israel? And I was like, huh? But I thought we were talking about band names, and I was like, "No, no, what's what? What is it?" And I'm like, "It's Kadima, but like, what? Can we actually talk about band names?" And everybody's like, "Oh, that's got a good ring to it." I'm like, "Guys, we're we're not doing that. That's not." They're like, "No, no, 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 no." Like, it's hey, just give it a chance, and you know, trying to be a good sport and be a team player. I was like, "Okay, <laughs> I'll I'll give it a I'll give it a shot. I'll let let's test it." You know, so I started talking to people, and when they would ask me, you know, "Hey, like, how's your new project going?" And like, "What did you guys get a name?" I was like. Yeah, we're thinking of calling it Kadima. And everybody's like, oh, that's cool. Like, sounds good. Like, what does that mean? And I was like, I guess I'm wrong. So I accepted it. And now now it's, you know, it's cool. But, you know, j- j- just so you're aware, like in, in Israel, when you tell people you're from Kadima, they look at it as a joke. They're like, you're from, like, imagine there was a city in Ontario called Forward. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, that's how ridiculous that name is so when people say like oh you're from kadima oh are you like from that town next to backwards or whatever yeah oh that's pretty cool yeah you're right forward be would be kind of a lame name for a band well i guess it works when it's uh exotic and foreign yeah yeah, yeah. right on right on oh you know and i was just thinking too you know you guys were talking about the the lack of concerts the thing I really missed this year was that intensity, that really sought, that really hot summer heat of like being at, even at a fair, let alone a concert, you know, like that energy of all the people around, but especially the outdoor concert and not having that overwhelming smell of pot everywhere. I'm like, <laughs> God, I missed that. That freaking that's one of my favorite things in the summertime is watching music. You got that smell. Like I'm not even promoting drugs necessarily, but that smell alone, (laughs) it just creates this like awesome energy and feeling of freedom and great music. And yeah, what a bummer to not have that experience this year. I was supposed to go to a journey concert in May you know, Journey, we're talking an old band, but I was stoked to see them, man. I got to see these guys before they're, you know, they're on their journey elsewhere. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, oh my. and so when I bought the tickets, you could actually order the t shirt with the ticket. So I thought, oh, hell, I'll, you know, skip the concession and I'll buy the ticket. So I got a Journey concert <laughs> tee says 2020 on it vancouver and everything i and never that, went man but i'm thinking that shirt is gonna be vintage that's gonna be oh, a yeah. relic one day the shirt from the show that never happened exactly yeah there's yeah. a lot of those man i i have a tour poster of ours that was supposed to be a big toronto finale show okay it's like this great poster we had and never happened because it was in may but I have it hanging on my wall right now. Cause I'm like, screw it, man. I paid for it. I'm, yeah. I'm hanging it up, dude. <laughs> you know, maybe it happened in some like alternate universe, multiverse version of our earth. Like COVID didn't happen. And man, who knows what's happening for you in that scene. Yeah. Whoever's running the simulation, put the wrong disc in. 
because in my mind the simulation still runs on like cds okay uh, yeah we just have to tell them to, to change this episode like you got the wrong one man yes yeah, honestly dude so guys you when you're not surfing and you're not playing music what else are you stoked about um a lot of things <laughs> <laughs> um i last year uh, my wife and i bought our first house nice. um so i can't say i'm stoked about being busy with the house but it's definitely kept us busy my wife definitely spearheads that uh venture mm-hmm. of uh taking care of the house so there's that and i'm learning little by little how to you know do manly things like uh fix the odd thing and you know hit a nail with a hammer and not break the whole wall so that kind of thing um but yeah other than that i mean i don't know i think music is such a such an all-consuming uh endeavor and surfing is the same and i think between surfing music and uh and uh you know having a wife or in andrew's case a girlfriend I don't think there's a lot of time left to be stoked on anything else. Yeah, you don't need. Who needs anything else? I don't. Yeah, man. Right on. I I would have to agree. Music engulfs you quite hard. At one point in time, I was a man of many hobbies, but I would say now that uh, surfing's in there, there's not much other than music, surfing, and my friends and girlfriend and craft beer, maybe sometimes. But uh, there you go. Get too carried away with that. Yeah, man. Nice. What are, you, what are you stoked about other than uh, surfing and doing this podcast? Oh, shit. Yeah, I'm kind of all over the place. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a nerd, too. I'm really into, uh, you know, superhero stuff, the Marvel movies, DC Comics, all these kinds of things. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of all over the place. I do some art. Um, I like to paint. I also... Uh, play drums but unfortunately just well now that i'm in Owen sound i don't know anybody who plays music but in vancouver i i had some buddies that i would get together with and and jam but i haven't played you know in a a bar scene or anything in quite a while Mm -hmm. but definitely like making music when i get the chance as well awesome well you'll once once things are a little easier you'd have to come to toronto and we'll have a little uh summertime jam session Man, we can jam, we can surf. Jeez, it's going to be awesome. It'll be like Kelly Slater and Jack Johnson. <laughs> Sick, hey, man. Perfect. Actually, that take... Kelly Slater and none of us are Jack Johnson, but it's it still works. I don't know, man. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Okay, I got to ask the question, guys, because when I started surfing, Jack Johnson was the shit. I mean, my favorite bands have always been Sublime, and I'm going to say Jack Johnson. But at some point, I, I felt this shift in pop culture that Jack Johnson kind of went from cool to, I don't know, like, is he perceived as soft or, I mean, is he cool anymore? He's cool to me. Yeah, he's cool to me. Is he? Okay. I, I but, think he's still cool. Yeah. Okay, I mean, right I get people all the time, though, being like, oh, my God, Jack Johnson, like, don't mention that name. But That's what I th- saw, too. Yeah. I mean... I think it's because his music can maybe be seen as a little bit cheesy. Like he's a dad and he pretty much always has been since he started creating music. He wasn't ever a music guy. He was supposed to be a cinematographer. Mm. He was supposed to be a pro surfer. You know what I mean? Like, I think it it just found a place and he started making this cheesy dad music, but I love it, man. I love Jack Johnson. I huge inspiration to surfing actually and music as well. But I do hear, people these days being like but so i don't know man i think he's cool i think he's a good guy he's doing some cool things still so because when i'm paddle boarding i bring out my iphone and my little bose speaker and you know i got my playlist when i'm on my sup and you know jack johnson will come on and i kind of look around i don't know like i'm like Am I looking cool right now, or am I looking like a fun dad? I, I'm not. Hell, sure. are you looking cool, man? It's listen. Jack Johnson is. I think he's cool. Yeah. Um, I I don't think. I think we're in an era where the concept of what's cool and what's not cool is is not a thing anymore. It's what what's cool is what's cool to you. If if you're 
you know, if you're like into really, you know, really out there, modern classical music, and that's cool to you and you're genuinely into it and it's an authentic, you know, authentic love that you have towards it. I think that's what wins and that's what constitutes cool. I know people who do all kinds of weird stuff. I, I can find you harp players who are cool as shit. You know, yeah, that's not just me saying it like it's it's you'd see that personality. It's just, you know, it, I think it's 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 all about what you make of it. That's one really, really cool thing about being a person in general in this day and age where you can be a metalhead who likes Britney Spears or you could be, a, you know, a, a hip hop guy who goes to Iron Maiden shows or, you know, you could be. A country like th th there's such a marriage of hip hop and country now. It's it's a big big yeah. thing. I think it's awesome. Beauty and the Blowfish. D there you go, Darius, man. Yeah. What a legend. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's kind of weird, and I always think of this like when I was a kid in school, littering was like you're so cool if you just like chuck your garbage out, and I was always that kid like running after my friend's garbage yeah. to throw it in the bin, and now mm -hmm. like it's the complete opposite. Now you're like a dickhead if you litter and like, you're yeah. so cool if you like go clean up the beach. But back when I was like eight picking up my friend's garbage, they just all thought I was an idiot and I wasn't cool at all, but things change, man. Well, I recently, uh, you know, I got this new job and I'm 38 years old and a lot of the folks I'm working with are, you know, I'm working with some people in the same position as me that are, you know, 21, 24, things like this. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, 21 Jump Street. Yep, of course. I, I kind of feel like that movie, like Channing Tatum, like he thinks he's so cool. He's got the backpack on with only one <laughs> strap. And then, you know, the kids are like, oh, that's ergonomically incorrect. You're going to hurt your back. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like things have changed, man. Like, cool you're right i think it's great we're in this sort of ubu era and hey yeah it's cool to you i love it man i mean being a great lake surfer especially when i started in 1999 it's like you gotta have confidence in yourself if you're gonna do something like that because so you guys know what that's like and in the words of billy madison if peeing your pants is cool then consider me miles davis yeah <laughs> I love You're Alex, not so. cool unless you pee your pants. <laughs> thanks for thanks for bringing that up. That was great. Yeah, you're very welcome. So, guys, uh, I think we're kind of coming to a close here. It has been, you know, amazing talking to you guys, and uh, this is this is an opportunity for you guys to to plug or where can people find you or, or follow you or or what are you up to? I think. Uh, uh, I think we've made it pretty easy for us to find each other. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but uh, I think basically um, Instagram, I think both for, for Andrew as Whaley and for myself as part of Kadima is the, the easiest place to find us. Um, if you just type in K A D E E M A on Instagram, it'll immediately take you to our Instagram uh, Whaley. Same thing. I don't think there are a lot of Whaley's out there. So. I mean, if you go to the Surf the Greats tagged photos, pretty much every photo in there is me because <laughs> <laughs> I tagged them on everything. <laughs> wow. So that's a great way to find me too. Wow, yeah, you're the model for Surf the Greats. No, I just try to be. I'm the hype man. That's the correct term. I've given hype Antonio man. so much free advertising. <laughs> if you're listening, Antonio, what the hell, man? Hook me up. Uh, he is, I, I will say he is a super, super hardworking guy. Every time I'm at the shop, um, there might be other people doing stuff. He's always just working on something. Um, and it's, I don't know if you're like aware of their activity, but there's always, they're always making something happen. There's some sort of an event, some sort of an initiative, some like it's, it's kind of amazing to me that they run a surf shop and a surf school yeah. and yoga classes and all that stuff and then a lot of community activity and man kudos to them and the the effect that they've had on you know especially the toronto scene has been priceless like what they've done is quite yeah. incredible they, they definitely pushed me into it and helped me get out there they have forecasting lessons that are unreal so 
if you're ever having a hard time getting to them, it's because they're busy as hell. Yeah, they're busy Absolutely. dudes. Yeah. They're great guys though. Yeah. No, stellar dudes. I hear you, man. The the uh, I got to be honest. Surf the Greats kind of created the model that I basically want to follow. My dream is to. Ha- I mean, I want this podcast to go places, but otherwise, I want to have a surf shop. Um, I want to teach yoga there. I want to run, you know, things from it. But my goal is to be doing that on the Lake Huron side. So, right, and really create a create a network. Like, I really think we need some cohesion with our Canadian surf shops. And so I'm excited to be a part of that. And people like Antonio are, are very collaborative rather than competitive. So I think it's a really good. Well, I think there's room for everybody. I think yeah. there's, you know, I mean, I don't, um, I, I don't know their business model. I don't know their, their profit margins or anything like that. So I, I will not make assumptions, but my guess is, you know, especially with the increase of, great lake surfers which which i've i've definitely seen in the three years that i've been in it um i think there's more need for you know for retail and there's more need for lessons and for just general surf culture and i mean you know andrew said this summer when you know on one of the many days we went to lake erie to surf because it was just pumping and he's like dude we're in a surf location this is you can surf here this is like Toronto is a surf town. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. And, and yeah. you know, it's, it's people like you guys who, who make it happen and it's awesome. We're, we're so fortunate for it. I, uh, I was teaching uh, sup and surf on, I've been doing it every Saturday with uh, Tara Coates out of surf sup eco shop in concurrent. Mm-hmm. And last Saturday we were teaching and, and I had to stop myself for a minute and I thought, Derek, like, you're teaching in Kincardine, man. You've been watching the waves pump in Kincardine. You've been hearing the legends, the tales of Kincardine. And here you are, out of all the places, you're teaching out of Kincardine. So I, I feel blessed. And uh, yeah, man, just all good things ahead, guys. And I cannot wait to, to meet you guys in person. Likewise. Get some music, catch some waves. I'm yeah, out. And I know Surf the Greats, they hold these... Um, water rescue course or something like that i'm gonna have to take that because i'm going for my uh international surf association surf instructor uh right on training soon and part of that is gotta have your bronze cross which i already have but we have to have this uh water rescue that waterman five does it apparently yeah. in partnership with open water Great. right so, yeah so i will be yeah. there for that when the, Whenever that happens, whenever we're allowed to, you know, see other people again. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Right on, guys. Okay. Definitely. Well, you, you plugged it all. Any uh, any closing words? Any words of wisdom? Oh man, I'm not a very wise guy. Tao's more of my sensei, so you might have some <laughs> words of wisdom. Uh, right on. Strike first, strike hard, no mercy. <laughs> shaka bra nice cobra kai we got a we got a member of cobra kai over here exactly nice right on all right guys mahalo for being on the show thanks brother stay stoked thanks man Yeah. Uh-huh.
If I ever even get that